Hey, welcome Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you are watching on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by the faithful host, Josh, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's hello, it going, Josh? hello. I go by Bishop. <laughs> yes, your or majesty. Or Apostle, either, you know, or your majesty. Or your, your excellency is what I Your heard. excellency, Josh. <laughs> um, and we're joined this week, actually, which is really weird. So like last week, I'm going on a tangent. Last week we had a Josh, and this week we have a William. So last week we, we, we talked to Josh Lewis uh, from Saving Elephants podcast, and <laughs> and this week we're talking to a William, so this is going to be super confusing. But um, but we are talking to William Nee. Um, he is our resident China expert. Um, he is the research and advocacy coordinator at Chinese Human Rights Defenders, uh, where he carries out research regarding a wide array of human rights concerns impacting human rights defenders in China. Previously, he worked as a Business and human rights analyst and China researcher at Amnesty International, where he researched human rights abuses caused by multinational companies and focused on freedom of expression, censorship, criminal justice developments, and the death penalty in China. Um, so welcome. Uh, welcome back, William. Yeah, thanks for having me, Will and Josh, and it's great to be back. Yeah, and and then for for our our faithful followers, if you're wondering why I said welcome back, William, it's because um, we actually interviewed him a while ago and um it was recorded on our secret podcast and by secret means that only the people that you see on the screen here and the uh podcasting hosting company we used yes <laughs> and uh it went down so this is actually william's second time on the show just the first time you've all probably seen him so yeah um and and i should i should also point out that he's not donald trump um uh, because <laughs> Um, I tweeted on April Fools that Donald Trump was going to be in our show on Tuesday, and uh, he's not. Unless you are, are you? Well, I'm disappointed to let down all the MAGA fans out there. <laughs> uh, but I guess people can pay you the extra, like hundred dollars, for the secret podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could pay hundred dollars. Access, access level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you subscribe to our Premium Platinum Plus yeah. uh, podcast. Uh, subscription whatever but anyways but yeah so uh how uh how have you been William good yeah I'm doing really well I've been here in the U.S. now for about a year um I lived in China including Hong Kong for about 20 years so it's been a little bit of a, an adjustment coming back mm -hmm. but um yeah things are going pretty well yeah how, how uh how have you uh, fared in the days of COVID um have you been lucky well, to dodge it uh, I have not gotten COVID, so I'm lucky in that respect. Um, I also live in a part of Utah, kind of in the a suburb of Salt Lake, but it's more in the south, um, where basically there's no restrictions whatsoever and haven't been since last April. So um, in many ways, COVID is not really something I think about that much <laughs> on a day, day basis, you know, so very, for better very or for worse, good. yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really awesome. You know, it's it's interesting. For better, <laughs> yeah, for better, yeah. I, yeah, I uh, just staying vaccinated and healthy. And that's basically as much as you can do, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's all totally. you got to do. Yeah, I went, I went and got a um, um, an allergy test um, recently, and uh, um, if you've never got an allergy test, they they take basically like an entire battalion worth of needles and they throw them at your back. And then <laughs> each, each of the needles have like different things like, you know, dog hair, cat hair, dust mites, like a whole gamut of stuff. And, uh, um, they, you have to sit there for like 15 minutes and your, your back is like super itchy and they're like, they don't want you to scratch it. They just want to see how it sort of like reacts and whatnot. So, um, when, when the nurse came in after 15 minutes, um, the, they said something that I'll never forget. They're like, wow, like you are allergic. And they're like, you're not just allergic. You're like impressively allergic <laughs> <laughs> to, to everything. And, right. and she's like, I think the earth is trying to kill you <laughs> basically. And I'm like, awesome. Great. Yeah. What a way to, to start, uh, this day, week, month, life, whatever. And, um, anyways, that has nothing to do with COVID um, or China. I just thought it was a funny story, and I wanted to get yeah. in there. But it's a great uh, story, dude. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but you're here to talk about China. So so um, um, obviously, like you've been following the news, like everybody else, we understand that Russia is trying to take over Ukraine. Um, 
there are a lot of different players, especially with uh, NATO, EU, what have you. And there seems to be sort of this one outlier, um, the a one major superpower that has yet decided to take a side one way or another in any sort of objective or definitive way, and that's China. And I and I curious to kind of get your thoughts, like of what like what's the play here? Like what what are the yeah. things that 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 that's keeping China from, you know, tipping the scales or taking a side one way or another? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would just preface everything I'll say today by basically saying, even in the China watching community, this is a huge topic of discussion and everybody has different points of view. So this is just kind of really what I've been seeing. And I could be wrong, but, you know, a lot of people are asking, is China on Ukraine's side? Well, that's obviously not the case. Is China on Russia's side? Well, I mean, most people are saying, China is on China's side. You know, that's the simplest way to think of it. They are doing whatever is in their interests. And that is kind of as simple as it is. Um, and they're not going to, um, you know, f- form a, you know, tight alliance with, with Russia. They don't have an alliance with anyone um, in the sense of like a treaty alliance. Um, they have an independent foreign policy um, and they are just going to do it, what's in their interests. Now, I think it's worth kind of breaking that down <laughs> into, into pieces, though, because I think um, one of the things to consider is um, how China is viewing the situation. Um, and, you know, China, from the very beginning, has, uh, you know, President Biden went to the Chinese government and showed them the intelligence before the war began and said, look, We're thinking a war is very likely it's going to happen, you know, maybe even at the end of February, early March. Um, Can you help us tell Russia and relay a message against the war? And China refused to believe the U.S. Um, Since it when the war did take place, um, you know, China has consistently blamed the U.S. and NATO for it. Um, You know, just yesterday in the People's Daily, which is the official mouthpiece of the Communist Party, um, they have they sometimes have an editorial called like Zhongsheng, which is like the voice of this. It means voice of the central government, basically. Um, and it's how they kind of give a, their main opinions of the leadership. And, you know, they said the U.S. is the initiator of this crisis. And it's all because the U.S. has not and NATO has not uh, NATO led by the U.S. has not considered Russia's interests. Um, and they've tried to expand NATO five times um, to the West or to the East. So, you know, China is, and on a domestic media level, they've, they're carrying Russian media, you know, basically like verbatim, like <laughs> um, they are censoring pro-Ukraine things um, and pro-Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, you know, posts on social media. Um, there have been academics who have written letters calling for peace um, that have been censored. So, and, you know, you don't see like the graphic um, displays of uh, the war um, and how it's impacting Ukraine when you watch Chinese TV. Um, Now, to some extent, CGTN, which is their global broadcaster, does have a little bit more balanced coverage. Um, But, you know, no one's really watching CGTN English. (laughs) The ratings are probably like five people. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, what people care about is how is the domestic media portraying this? Um, and so they're, it's really a very one-sided Russia thing. Um, right. And so that's, that's kind of the, 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 you know, that's in a nutshell um, where it's at. And I, I'd say, like, why is that? Um, you know, to a large extent, I think China views the Ukraine crisis through its own lens, through its own grievances, through its own paranoias. Um, And mainly through like political security. So they're very concerned about being surrounded um, by the U.S. and the West, Um, you know, and they view, um, you know, they they talk a lot about color revolutions. So I don't don't know if you're familiar with the the term Mm -hmm. color revolutions, but um, basically China is obsessed and, and Russia obsessed with the notion that the U.S. government working with NGOs and civil society will fund actors in foreign countries that will then um, have uprisings for popular change, for democracy and human rights. 
And so they see this happening in Georgia, uh, not, not the state, the country, uh, many years ago, um, in, in, in Ukraine, um, the, the Jasmine Revolution in the Middle East in, in like uh, about a decade ago, they saw that as a U.S. example, um, and then other Central Asian republics. And they, they, are, they think that um, Ukraine is kind of an example of this. Um, I mean, the, the Zhongsheng, the People's Daily article mentioned this. So they are kind of blaming uh, Ukraine's desire for sovereignty, for independence, for freedom, for democracy, uh, independent of Russia. They're blaming that essentially on the U.S. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, and that th they see this through the lens of political security because they are so focused on ensuring that, like, whenever they talk domestically, they talk about politi political security is number one and regime security for the Chinese Communist Party. And what that means is that, like, uh, you know, for, for example, last year, as my organization documented, they really cracked down on feminists uh, because they think that, you know, and LG, LGBT community mm. in China, where they closed down many LGBT student groups. Um, they, they kicked off many of the most prominent feminists from social media because they think that they're bringing in Western ideology. Um, you know, they went after churches um, and, and pastors and uh, cracked down on the space for uh, churches to operate and also operate in the era of COVID in which a lot of things have to be done online. So you can basically only go through the official government platforms. Um, and they did this in many ways for its, what, they, what they view as ideological security. Um, and so, I mean, that's kind of the lens th through which they're seeing it, I think, mm. is through, you know, Russia being encircled and they feel, oh, we're being encircled. And, you know, I don't, you know, if you look at Putin, Putin wrote, um, you know, he wrote an article last summer that gave a long, like 5,000 plus word essay um, detailing his thoughts on Ukraine and the very detailed historical situation and how he views Russia and Ukraine is kind of inseparable. Um, and, you know, Russian civilization to some extent began in where current Ukraine is um, and the Russian Orthodox Church. Right. And so, you know, Russia has this deep, it's like a spiritual significance Ukraine has for, for Russia. And Putin has this long list of grievances um, in his own way. Um, and many Russian experts said that, that his essay had many, many historical inaccuracies and and biases, um, which I'm sure they did. But what's interesting is China doesn't get into that when they talk about the Ukraine crisis. And they don't talk about like Putin's internal domestic rationale very much. They mainly see it through their own, their own like lens. Right. Um, so what, so, what do you think, well, what do you think would happen? Uh, or, or I guess a better way to put it is why is China so afraid of NATO and the West being close to them, especially if they've become so, it seems so interdependent upon us to purchase their goods, things like that. It feels like there's a lot of um, uh, inconsistency there. And I guess I'm curious as to what, what are they afraid uh, yeah. is going on? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think... Um... We yeah, there is the notion that um, as we talked about last time on our secret podcast, I think that there was a notion maybe ten or twenty or thirty years ago um, that uh, which the China watching community calls engagement, where through economic trade, through greater cultural trade, uh, uh, you know, exchanges and so on, over time, China would converge towards the West. Um, and, you know, in the last decade, I think we've realized, uh, and especially in the Trump era, I'd say, we basically gave up on that strategy. Um, and, and because kind of we've given up on that, and there's um, China, I think, is seeing that in the U.S., maybe the, that Trump um, and his last year in office, that very, very anti-China positions, maybe they're seeing that that wasn't an aberration, that you know, Biden has to some extent continued many of this, these things. 
Um, and look at it from China's point of view. You know, you have 1.3 billion people, right? You have an economy that is still growing strong, and they could become the number one economy in the in the near future. Um, but they also are, you know, surrounded. You know, they, we, uh, you think of the U.S. Ge geopolitically. We we have Canada above us and Mexico below us. They're surrounded by by many countries. And the U.S. has hundreds of military bases worldwide. We have alliances with Japan, with South Korea, uh, you know, with with obviously in Europe and NATO um, and many other countries, uh, Australia. Um, and there's been a lot of tension with Australia and the U.S. power. And when when there's a strong power among the U.S. and all of its allies, it's much stronger than China. So I think that they're very concerned about the extent to which that um, power might, that collective power could be used, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, what, what I, I guess what strategic um, benefit or like what, what mutual benefit does, does China have by playing it nice with Russia? I, I mean, I, I, I know you said earlier, you know, like we don't or they don't necessarily want kind of these Western democracies to just kind of sneak up closer and closer to their borders. But, but, you know, China for the most part is, you know, I would say much more safer than Russia would be if that's a concern of theirs. Um, so, yeah. I mean, like, do, do, do the two countries have such ties like import export, you know, that, that if Russia decides to, you know, ban China or sanction China, I mean, I'd imagine China would just sort of just like, just wipe it off their shoulder and be like, yeah, so yeah. what, you know? Well, um, I, yeah, it's a good question. I think one factor is, um, you know, China, if you look at the Chinese communist party's, uh, internal, uh, messaging like in the People's Daily and and their own speeches, they talk about this being an era of changes not seen in a hundred years. They use this phrase over and over. They view the West as in uh, main a huge decline. They see the U.S. in decline. They see the U.S. as dysfunctional, uh, <laughs> and which to some extent is true, right? <laughs> but um, and so they and they want to go towards a multipolar world. Um, you know, they talk about this. These are points that come over again and again. Um, and Russia uh, is kind of an ally in this quest. So Russia has obviously seats on, um, you know, the UN per, uh, Security Council. Uh, it has a lot of global clout. Um, it has a lot of military influence. Um, you know, their economic ties are, are there. I mean, I think there's definitely oil and gas, but I mean, Russia isn't a huge economic player. I mean, I think it's you know, another factor that's very important to say is obviously China hosted the Winter Olympics just in, you know, fe yeah. February. And this was a huge moment of face and of, of national glory and whatnot. Um, but most of the Western democracies, uh, or not most, but many of the Western democracies, including the U.S., had a diplomatic boycott um, of the Olympics, which was a big loss of face, I think, for the government, uh, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping's government, um, you know, because this is really kind of where they are, want to, you know, show the national glory and show their own population that the rest of the world kind of recognizes the importance. Yeah. Um, now, why was that? Well, part of it's because, you know, there's a major human rights crisis going on in China. You know, there, what's happening in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region you know, the western part of China, three times the size of France. They have up to a million Muslims and other people, other, not all of them are Muslims, some are, you know, maybe secular, but a million ethnic minorities in some form of detention, whether that's a re-education camp or an outright prison. Um, you know, people are serving long sentences for no reason, you know. Um, you know, there's, there's one case I've been working on a lot uh, is the case of Gulshan Abbas. She was a retired doctor and basically because her daughters are abroad and one of them became a Uyghur activist, um, they detained her and sentenced her for a long prison term. You know, and she's just one of many, many cases. Just about every Uyghur you meet abroad um, has some sort of story. 
So this, over time, built to the level that people can no longer really ignore this. You know, there's there's issues with religious freedom and and Tibet, of course, um, human rights defenders um, and the persecution of them. But this really caused a diplomatic boycott. So of the heads of state who showed up to the Olympics, lo and behold, <laughs> who was the most important and the most famous? Putin. Um, and so Putin sh showed up showed up and. On February 4th, Russia and China signed a, a joint statement of interests. Um, there's a very, very long document, um, I think more than 5,000 words. Yeah. Um, but it basically said the most important phrase really was, our friendship knows no limits. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. that this is better than a traditional alliance that was formed by the West during uh, the Cold War era. Um, and that we have a cooperation that knows no bounds. Um, so they, they set this up just days before, you know, uh, or weeks before Russia was set to launch the war. So, you know, one, one thing to think about is how awkward would it be for Xi Jinping to have signed a joint statement and meeting Putin personally, and then three weeks later to come out and condemn Russia? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it just, you know, that, that part is not very realistic. Um, yeah. Um, now, from the Chinese government's point of view, to be fair to them, they say that they're providing extra space for um, a, a peaceful solution. Um, but I think, you know, that's that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, in, in, a, in a scenario in which one country invades another country and is pummeling them on a daily basis, you know, you can't really be neutral. You know? mm -hmm. um, there's no, you know, if someone's raping another person, you can't say, oh, I, let's be neutral and have them work it out in counseling. No. You know, it, during the act of aggression, you know, so I, I think China, yeah, it, it, it doesn't really, uh, but I think for face saving reasons, that February 4th joint statement is just crucial to understand how much it boxed China in, in some respects. Yeah. You know, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, if the U.S.'s expectation for China is not necessarily to declare you know, uh, a very public rebuke of what Russia is doing. Like you can, maybe they can be very boisterous about, you know, staying neutral and maybe lean a little towards Putin. But as long as they're not, you know, providing weapons or mm -hmm. any sort of logistic logistical aid, um, it's just sort of pomp and circumstance. And, and, you know, the U.S. is just like, well, you know, at least they're not they're not contribute. They're not making it worse. <laughs> so, yeah. so like, is, yeah. is, 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 is that a, is that a fair uh, characterization of maybe what the U S should just expect from China? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, someone in the government leaked that they, that Russia had told China or asked China for weapons, um, as I'm sure you heard. And, um, and then China did, well, Russia denied that China denied that, um, and China, I think, said it's not going to provide any any weapons to Russia to make things worse, as you said. Um, but yeah, and then I think the, the Biden administration has made clear to China that if it helps Russia evade sanctions, it could face um, you know severe repercussions. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with that, quite frankly, because I think there's mixed signals. I mean, I think there's there. I've heard some reports that. Chinese companies have been very cautious of now about assessing their business deals and are, are you know, as they're very, at least com on the company level, they might be very pragmatic and thinking, we don't want to get sanctioned, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I, 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 I need my iPhone. With Putin. I don't care what's happening with C, but as far as I need my, my iPhone goes, 15. I need my iPhone 15. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um but then again, the, uh, you know, the Chinese um, ambassador in Moscow apparently told a bunch of business people there, like, we should take advantage of this situation and buy things up while they're cheap. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that's going to be one thing to really watch is to what extent China helps Russia. Does China help Russia to evade um, or to, just, to what extent are they buying their oil? Are they helping them with different payment systems? Um, with, you know, uh, buying assets on the cheap. I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about this, but we, we don't really know exactly how that's going to work out at this point. Right. So, 
So without China, Russia would be not able to do what they're doing. It kind of seems like, like, so I guess like if, so we got this China, Russia alliance, so to speak, mm -hmm. partnership, whatever yeah. we want to call it. Um, how, so, so if the U S decided to sanction them, sanction China, and of course, I know that depends on what sanctions we're talking about, but what would that actually do to China's economy? Like how much of a threat is that, that he, that Biden would say that? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it, it very much could pose a threat to China's economy, uh, for sure. Um, but I think the U.S. would be much more reluctant to go that far um, because, you know, Russia, I think, has, if I'm not mistaken, has the GDP of Chicago. You know, it's, it's or, or the state of Florida, um, something like that. So it's, you know, it's, it's a completely different thing than China. You know, putting sanctions on China that, that, that were meaningful would have ramifications for the whole global economy. And it would um, cost us. It would cost us, for sure. Um, now, China is in a difficult situation right now. I mean, I, I'm not an economics expert, expert, but I think GDP forecasts have been going down. You know, the Omicron surge, which in the U.S., I think we're like, oh, it's basically nothing. Um, for better, for worse, um, you know, because I think so many people have, by that point had had COVID and had some degree of natural immunity or, you know, had been vaccinated. But China is not doing well with this Omicron surge. I mean, Hong Kong, where I used to live for 13 years, has a tremendous amount of deaths after dealing with the COVID pandemic really well. Um, is Omicron is just devastating them. And it, Shanghai where I also lived for four years, uh, you know, incredible city of 30 million people. Like this is one of the most modern cities in the world and a great, great place is being shut down. Some places, some districts have been shut down for a long time. Uh, Jilin up north, um, it, it kind of an in industrial area of China is, is, has a shutdown. Um, so now when you shut down a place like Shanghai, 30 million people, that has supply chains that affect the whole world. I mean, that is going to have major economic ramifications for everything that we buy in the next few months anyway, you know, yeah. and it's probably going to hurt our inflation and all those things. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know um, to what extent the U S would actually be willing to pull the trigger on sanctions against China. Um, especially given that for the best of my knowledge, China's not really providing Russia with, actual weapons. Um, but I, I think it's just crystal clear that doing so would be very detrimental to, to the U S and, and the whole world too, which is a one thing that's very much worth saying though. Um, you know, we may be looking at Europe, uh, Ukraine, Russia, China, this is kind of our lens. China has been extremely active over the last month or so in Africa. Um, at the uh, Organization of Islamic States, uh, or OIC. Um, you know, Wang Yi, their foreign minister, gave a speech there. Even as they are putting Uyghurs in prison for, and, uh, you know, the U Uyghur Human Rights Project, a, a group in D.C., has documented over a thousand imams who have been detained. And yet their foreign minister goes to the Islamic, you know, the OIC, Islamic uh, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, um, and gives a speech, you know, and what China's doing is it's saying, it's highlighting its its position of kind of independence um, from both Russia and the U.S. Um, and it's trying to say, look, what the U.S. is doing is going to have ramifications for oil to make our gas much more expensive, to make uh, food, like, you know, uh, I mean, Quite frankly, I think we all know Russia is the one who's causing that. Russia is the one who's yeah. starting the war. This is the way mm -hmm. China's positioning it, though. Is like your rising food costs are because of the U.S. Um, <laughs> and so they're going to have, I think, quite a bit of success in that messaging in the third world. 
and um, or not the third world. I think that's derogatory. The, the developing world, yeah. um, as you were saying, uh, you know, with Latin America as well. Um, you know, in many ways, this is probably the problem with the U.S. foreign policy establishment is that uh, so much of the world is kind of like the proverbial swing voter, you know, and we we don't show up. And when we do show up, it's to say, hey, don't you realize how bad China is? <laughs> um, <laughs> instead of talking to those countries on their own terms and kind of trying to provide them with with the things that they need. Yeah, I, I also I, I heard not heard. I, I read that um, China's involvement in Africa um, aside from just geopolitical, whatever, um, positioning, um, is also due to their interest in cobalt in the Congo. Yeah. So like cobalt, yeah. like 70% of like the world's supply mm-hmm. of cobalt comes from the Congo and cobalt's the, the, I don't know, the mineral that's used in like batteries for electric cars. So, um, whoever like yeah. ha- controls that is going to control the, the like electrical vehicle market for the next 50 years or what have you. Have you heard that well, too? Interesting that you mentioned that because <laughs> as it so happens when I worked at Amnesty International, um, I worked on the business and human rights team and we did a series of reports on cobalt from the DRC. Um, so the first one is called um, uh, This is What We Die For, hmm. which basically looked at, um, you know, people in Kolwezi, uh, the, the coal mining or the cobalt mining area of, of the DRC, you have these art, artisanal miners, which basically means people digging cobalt by hand. Mm-hmm. Um, many, many children working there, just basically going around with bags, picking up these blue rocks, um, digging in very, uh, like with picks, just kind of chopping it. And it's toxic too. So it's mm-hmm. it's horrible. Digging deep holes, deep wells um, that have a high rate of collapse. Um, and then this artisanal cobalt then they'll go to the markets um, and, you know, kind of like a, an outdoor, you know, farmer's market type of thing. Um, and at these markets, many of those people who buy the cobalt are Chinese people mm-hmm. who then sell it to the Chinese companies. And so basically we had two of, two of my uh, fellow researchers were in the DRC, basically looked at the, this, this process, followed these people, went to the market, saw the company that they were selling it to, which is called Huayo Cobalt who then was selling it to smelters that were then selling it to the whole supply chain, you know, BMW, Tesla, Apple, basically mm-hmm. Samsung, uh, all sorts of Chinese EV uh, producers. So, yeah, I, yeah, what was amazing to me in that regard was, you know, this is where the energy revolution, the EV industry is really developing. It, it still very much depends on cobalt and these other battery minerals. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, what was amazing to me is that, uh, and, well, let me just say that the Chinese companies involved did make some positive changes. So it's not like they, um, you know, you know, they, they weren't uh, completely bad. Um, but um, what's amazing to me is that the U.S. Uh, and other major miners were not really anywhere to be found. Um, and so, I'm, you know, I just saw yesterday that uh, I think Biden is potentially going to sign something. Mm-hmm. on securing battery minerals but yeah. you just kind of wonder where where were you guys this is <laughs> i know <laughs> you know this is like you know something hello like mm. you know yeah yeah that's, that's funny i um there's so it's so complicated like this whole like this this interrelationship between china and the whole world you know and, yeah um, and 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 then the the you know, the fact that these wars can affect us so much, like we're just in such a global, um, you know, culture and age where we're so affected by things happening um, all over the place that are so far from us. Um, When I'm, you know, when I'm thinking about um, the future where all this stuff is going. I'm wondering what China's end game is. Um, like, is it world domination? Is it, we don't know, we're just going to keep getting bigger until we can't get bigger anymore. Is it, I mean, mm. what is it? Yeah. Cause you're making these statements like 
China, like the government itself, right? We're separating that from the Chinese people, from yeah. all that, right? Obviously, many, many wonderful people mm -hmm. in China. Um, but I'm just thinking like this government, they're pretty bad, right? right. I guess by Western standards, they're mm -hmm. they're bad. I mean, how should we how should we view the Chinese government? Huh? Yeah. Favorably, no, unfavorably? I mean, what, what what do you think? I mean, are they bad? Are they evil yeah. in some way? Well, I, I think that's, that's, that's a very, very, uh, that's the, probably the most important question. What is China's end game and what, it, how to view the government? Um, you know, I think, uh, I think if I were to make a prediction is China wants to, in the words of the government. So in many ways, China is very hard to know because unlike the Washington DC where there's so many journalists, so many cocktail parties and Bob Woodward tends to know everything and so many other journalists know everything because there's every, everybody leaks everything, you know, China's the opposite. It has complete secrecy. You know, no one's ever really going to know what the top leadership says or thinks in private. But on the other hand, they do, they do basically say what they, what they want to do in their government documents and in things like the People's Daily, um, fairly, almost transparently um, sometimes, but they write in such a trudged kind of bureaucratic way with all these euphemisms that it makes it almost hard to know what they're talking about. But I think what they want to do is Xi Jinping says he wants to go back to center stage. So they want the Chinese government to go back to the center of global affairs in their view. From their point of view, China was always a great power, if not the best in the world. And it was really only with the opium wars in the 1800s where, you know, Britain literally fought a war to get China, China to change its trade policies and accept opium, you know, having, you know, millions of people become opium addicts uh, and China lost its sovereignty. There were port cities, Hong Kong, Qingdao, um, uh, you know, Shanghai and many others where foreigners had more rights uh, and, and more like than Chinese people. So they view this historical humiliation, the hundred years of humiliation is something that in their press, you read about all the time, like on a daily basis on the news all the time, you read about the hundred years of humiliation. We can I've never, never even heard week. of that. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very much set in their national um, consciousness. And this, this, and then, of course, the Japanese killed millions and millions of people and they fought a war of resistance. Um, so from their point of view, being a strong country that can stand up to bullying outsiders, and they see the U.S. as a bully right now, is so ingrained in their national narrative that that's just something I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just something for Americans to be aware of. Uh, that that's kind of the way that um, they see the world. And it, there's a degree of truth to it, too. So, But they want to go back to center stage um, and be a strong country. And China, they ex explicitly say that. Xi Jinping is proud of making it Qiangguo, which means strong country. And he says, we've become rich. We've become strong. So there's a lot of national pride in that. And I, I think that's not something to scoff at. Because, you know, if you can imagine, you know, just to maybe give an analogy, if you're an African-American, um, and you've come from, uh, you've, your culture has experienced tremendous hardships and you are able to then become strong. Even if your society has problems, you know, you might take a lot of pride in that, right? So I think we have to be, be aware of that. Um, I think they want to change the rule. I think they do want globalization to continue, um, but they want the rules uh, and the institutions to favor China in a much more... Um, in a much more explicit way, but they've said they don't want to become the global uh, superpower. I mean, I, I don't know. I think they, they probably do, but I don't think they want world domination necessarily. Um, right. And they, they do see a, they do see a future of a multipolar world. So, so all of that is to say my, my personal view, I think we still as Americans can, um, uh, you know, have a future with China. It's still worth having diplomacy, a smart diplomacy, um, but the government itself, I mean, it's mixed because they've done many good things over the last many years. They've done 
in, in terms of uh, decreasing poverty, um, you know, the, the infrastructure they've built, the health they've built, the, they're building a social safety net. But at the end of the day, it's they're very anti-democratic, anti-human rights. Um, you know, the torture is widespread. What they're doing to ethnic minorities is horrible. Um, so it's it's really kind of a, a complicated situation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, so they have all these plans, right? Like they're mm-hmm. five year plans. Yeah. Right. So they have all these plans, and I guess like I'm I'm always just um, I'm I'm what's the word I'm looking for? I'm befuddled. That's a good word. Befuddled mm-hmm. by China, mm-hmm. because I think. This has got this like almost totalitarian autocratic government that is doing exceptionally well in terms mm-hmm. of its growth mm-hmm. uh, economically, mm-hmm. right? But a lot of that has been, if I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of that has been because of their, because they started taking a step back from having all the control and allowing the economic you know, kind of more capitalistic, you know, values, obviously not wholesale, but capitalistic Mm -hmm. values to, to flourish a little bit, giving more freedom. And it it seems like there's like an ebb and flow of that, depending on who's in charge in China, which is to be expected. But I guess, can, can they sustain this kind of growth Mm. with the government that they have and where they're heading with Xi Jinping? Can they sustain it? I mean, is that, is it possible? I guess I'm like, how is it, can we really see that we have a, can they have their cake and eat it too, essentially? Yeah, and yeah I mean, that, that's that's another like really, really uh, like a uh, million dollar question that, <laughs> um, you know, you're right. I think, you know, one thing to keep in mind is like the, the Mao, per- Mao Zedong era, right? From 1949 until 1976, when Mao Zedong ruled, and that was where it was really totalitarian, kind of Stalinistic, uh, to, to oversimplify. At the same time, you know, they did get a lot of public health programs. You know, they, people's literacy went went from being like very few people were literate to almost not universal literacy, but you know, up, upwards of ninety percent. Um, you know, equality for women to to a large extent was was promoted. Um, you know all of these things, but they had a gigantic population that was in terrible poverty. I think when Mao died, China was one of the poorest countries in the world then. Then, you know, Deng Xiaoping, to oversimplify again, the the next leader kind of came in with a much more pragmatic approach. And his whole thing was reform and opening, where the, the, com- the country would open up to the outside world. They needed capital. They needed technical know-how, how to run a factory, how to do all these things. And they set up economic zones. There was a lot of investment. And then China's like economic boom went on, but partly because of the demographic dividend. So you had the so many kids, you know, being born in the Mao era. Like I think the average woman had, I, I don't know exactly, it was three point something or four kids, to then having a one child policy in the 80s. So all of a sudden you have a lot of workers coming about who are in their 20s going to factories from the countryside, um, you know, to work in. And there's all these people who can work for dirt cheap for peanuts. Um, and then they only they have minimal dependence because, you know, one person might have many brothers and sisters who are supporting two parents above them. But below them, they only have one kid. Uh, you know, so that was a point where. China really was benefiting, but now demographically, um, that, that, that advantage of the one child policy is now coming home to roost where you have many young millennials who feel like, okay, like if you have a wife and now you have two parents above you to support because many people support, help support their parents. Um, so you have four kind of dependents above you (laughs) and then maybe one, one or two children and you have to pay for private school, you have to pay for piano lessons and <laughs> many other things. It's really kind of a burden. So, you know, many people talk about, well, can China really grow like that? The wages for workers have, have increased quite a bit over the last decade, uh, just because of a natural economics. Um, the aging population is going to have much more in terms of healthcare resources they need. 
So, you know, many people are kind of pessimistic about that they can have that breakneck growth that can continue. Um, you know, and this is the big topic, like can China, uh, you know, tackle the middle income trap, um, so to speak. Right. Now, um, 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 William, I, I'm curious um, to, to, to kind of uh, go back to um, Ukraine a little bit. And yeah. I'm I, I'm curious to get your thoughts. How how closely China is looking at what's happening in Ukraine, in Ukraine and their alliances or relationships with other key players um, and how they're looking at their relationship and maybe their, um, you know, their focus on Taiwan. Um, mm. Because, uh, because I, 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 I've, I've read it in a lot of different articles where, where, you know, uh, Taiwan is basically China's Ukraine. Um, mm. And, uh, and I'm curious if you can kind of give us your thoughts and, and maybe before you, you give us your thoughts, uh, just briefly tell us about, you know, what is, what is the Taiwan China connection? Yeah. Well, I mean, the Taiwan issue is um, where to make, you know, oversimplifying things where there was a civil war in the 1930s and forties uh, in China and the the nationalists, the KMT, um, Kuomintang, they lost, uh, and they fled to Taiwan, um, and th- like two million people went in boats uh, to Taiwan. Uh, they for many years they claimed that they ruled all of China. You know, it was kind of a a pipe dream. Uh, they they actually had like people in parliament representing the areas in China that they were from, um, and so on, uh, and. Um, on the PRC side, they, they said that they will very soon liberate Taiwan. You know, they will liberate. That was imminent, um, you know. And then during the Korean War, uh, you know, the U.S. then protected Taiwan. Um, and so, but then when, you know, there was relations again with, with uh, you know, Kissinger, um, and then it was normalized during Carter, I think there was an expectation that the Taiwan issue will be worked out sooner or later, right? Um and China said there's only one chi- one China because um, the, the Taiwan was officially known it still is as the Republic of China. China is the People's Republic of China. So there's this issue of okay, let's um, let's kind of um, just kick the can down the road with the Taiwan issue because sooner or later China will probably become democratic, uh, maybe in the 2000s sometime or you know th- this where we are now. Um, and then they will work it all out through dialogue, right? Well, unfortunately, what happened in the meantime is that China has become none, none the more democratic. It, you know, if anything, probably the 80s or maybe the first decade of this century were the high point of Chinese like liberty and human rights. The Hong Kong came back to China's sovereignty in 1997 under the one country, two systems model which was seen as a model for Taiwan. So it's kind of like, Taiwan, look at what we can do. We can give you your sovereignty, more or less, except for military and foreign affairs. And look at what Hong Kong is able to do. It's able to keep its own economy, its own way of life, its own media, its own uh, you know, uh, currencies, its own academic institutions. And now what China is doing in Hong Kong is they're basically implementing a one country, one system approach. And you have pro-democracy people in jail. And it's just, you know, horrible. So now there's no, there's no possible notion of a kind of a, at least for right now, of a, a negotiated settlement to kind of get Taiwan back. So that's one thing that's made people very nervous. On the other hand, if you look at Taiwan public opinion of, do you consider yourself Chinese? Do you consider yourself Chinese and Taiwanese? Or do you consider yourself only Taiwanese? I mean, I don't have the figures in front of me, but it went from a lot of people saying that they were Chinese or Chinese and Taiwanese to now almost all the people say that they're just Taiwanese. Mm, wow. So Taiwan has developed a much more um, of, a, of a, a, a notion of its own kind of identity separate from China mm. um, in, in the last like, you know, 30 plus years. Um, and, and part of that was because in the 80s, they went democratic. Um, the, the mainlanders, the people who had came, come over and ruled kind of in a brutal authoritarian manner, 
from you know the the 40s to the 80s um, were kind of gotten rid of, and there was a reckoning and kind of a Taiwanese identity. So, yeah, that that's caused a, a big problem now. Um, but we've kind of continued to kick the can down the road. But there's now, I think, an assumption by many people that Xi Jinping doesn't want this to go on forever. Um, you know, and so what would that mean? You know, if he doesn't want it to go on forever, this is a crucial year where he is going to probably at the 20th Communist Party Congress, um, which is a little bit like their presidential terms, like every five years they have a Congress, he will most likely be selected um, for another term, kind of breaking with tradition, where tradition held that you had two terms of five years. So he is kind of going towards a Putin-style dictator for life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what I personally fear is that he, for his own glory and the glory of what he sees as uh, China regaining its rightful place, um, that they will try to, uh, um, from their point of view, take back Taiwan. Um, now, Taiwanese people take offense at that because they said that we've never been uh, under mainland uh, sovereignty. Um, but um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a big dilemma. Um, and, you know, I don't really have a, a great solution for it. Um, you know, but but the question, I guess, is to what extent is it like Ukraine? I mean, I think there's significant differences. I mean, after the fall of the Soviet Union, you, the Ukraine became a sovereign country with its own borders, its own government, um, and no one in the international system contested that. Right, right now, in contrast, um, there's very few countries, only I think like 15 left that recognize the Republic of China mm -hmm. and the rest re recognize the People's Republic of China. But Taiwan has acted as a de facto independent country. So it, it's had its own legal system, its own education, its own political system. That's all been a success story, a huge success story. I mean, they've they've basically become a developed country. They have a uh, it's a democracy. They have a fairly good human rights situation. They even subject themselves to human rights treaties that they haven't been able to sign. <laughs> they have international <laughs> experts come in and uh, appraise, you know, look at their situation. Um, you know, they, they are pretty pro environment. Uh, you know, it's they have freedom of religion. You know, they also have, they have um, a military LGBT marriage. Right. So, it, mm. you know, in many ways, um, do they have a military? You know, it's, it's difficult. They have their own military. Yeah. Mm. So it's difficult to then say, um, yeah, the democratic world is going to let Taiwan, this shiny success story, be be taken over by, you know, this increasingly totalitarian, you know, uh, communist behemoth. You know, it, it would look terrible. But on the other hand, if you defend Taiwan, um, you know, or make pledges that you're going to do so, you could risk, you know, see and, and the government losing face to the extent that they might want to launch an invasion. Um, so I'm, I'm not really a military expert, but um, it, I would say the Taiwan issue over the next few years will increasingly become a huge point of um, a flashpoint. I mean, if there were to be a war between China and the U.S., it would almost certainly be about Taiwan, I think. And, and of course, like China is probably thinking about all of this as they decide how entangled they want to be with with Russia, I'm assuming. I mean, like they, they want to go in, if they do decide to invade Taiwan, they want to go in with a strong hand, not not on the, the heels of, you know, like sanctioning by the entire world, I, I take it. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of Chinese analysts um, look, have been looking at the sanctions very much as like, um, you know, as a football coach would look at the gameplay of, the team you're going to play, what what happened their last game. They're looking at this like, okay, this is what they're doing to Russia. Now, how do we need to prepare um, in case we uh, face a similar situation? So not they're not looking at it as like, oh, how can we help Russia stop invading Ukraine? And they're like, oh, <laughs> this is the game plan. Let's let's prepare, fellas, you know. So crazy. Yeah. Go, uh, go, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's amazing to think about um, Taiwan and and um, 
you know, the kind of, the kind of tension that it's causing and to think about how strategic China really is, you know, and it seems like in everything that they do, they're just, they're, they're very strategic. Everything is kept, you know, um, under wraps, like you said, like, I guess, I think that the average American, including myself, um, we don't even understand like how, um, like we don't even understand China. Like we just, uh, it's so different. We don't even get it. Like even to the point of like, like that they could have like the, again, the Uyghurs and, Mm -hmm. and everything that's going on there. And yet, I mean, there's a, I mean, I'm sure there's like a bunch of, um, like, uh, what do you call it? Like, um, human rights organizations that are trying to make it public, but I didn't even know about it before. I didn't even know that term existed Mm -hmm. before our last podcast or the, the secret one. Yeah. And, uh, it's just amazing. Like how, how do they, how do they keep things so secret? And what, I mean, one thing is what's going on with the Uyghurs and, Mm. and how are they able to keep this? Like, how are they able to justify this or keep this out of the scrutiny of the global global community? Yeah. yeah, Community. Or maybe they're not. And it just doesn't matter because they're such a powerhouse. Yeah. We can't. Well, you know, I mean, one thing you're talking about, I think, makes me think a little bit. Um, there's a guy named Jeremiah Jenny who has a great podcast called Barbarians at the Gate. Um, and he's a historian who lives in Beijing, American. Um, and he's from Boston. And he gives the analogy that, um, you know, for China, it's kind of like they're Boston fans. Uh, and they think about New York. They think about the Yankees all the time. You know, and he's like, and Yankees fans, they think about the Red Sox at times, but they don't obsess about them, you know. Um, right. So there's this kind of this disparity where China is constantly obsessing and thinking about the West, studying the West. Um, every educated Chinese person has learned English. They all like watch Hollywood movies. They all like are, are somewhat aware of our political system. And we just don't really have a similar kind of focus on China. <laughs> So I think that's very unfortunate. I mean, I think we need to address that somehow because, you know, whether you're, whether we're talking about the global economy, whether we're talking about in the environment, promoting EVs, Russia, uh, everything, t- supply chains. I mean, it all kind of has some degree of China impact or China. So we, we need to kind of understand them and kind of um, get better as a society. But in terms of the Uyghurs, um, I think... You know, the thing is, is that um, they basically, starting from 2014, had this, well, there were numerous terrorist incidents in China. Um, uh, There was a person who drove a car in Tiananmen Square, veered off and like ran over some people right at the heart of like their most symbolic place. Um, There were uh, a person at the Kunming train station, a few people got out with knives and knifed, um, I think it was like 70 people to death. Um, and then there were a few others at a train station and a market. So they had this string of kind of terrorist incidents. Um, now to what, I mean, at the same time, like in the West, right, there was ones in London, there were ones in France, the U S. Um, so I, you know, it, it, it's been difficult to assess to what extent were these incidents related to um, global jihad for, if you will, or were they nationalist sentiments or like for the Tiananmen one, I I believe I read that the guy had an incident in his home where the government took some of his stuff and demolished his home. So he kind of went nuts. And I mean, that type of thing happens in China all the time with like local people getting angry and, you know, having revenge on the local government, you know, but when that happens, in a Han context, like Han Chinese is the predominant ethnicity. When it's Han on Han violence, like they're like, oh, well, some guy went nuts. 
But if it's like a Uyghur versus Han, then they immediately say terrorism. You know, so it's it, it's a little bit like in the U.S. where a white shooter, a school shooter is like, well, you know, what, it's mental health, you know. <laughs> so it's a, there's a little bit of that going on. But um, but after these incidents, China decided to really crack down. Um, and just they had this party secretary who came in and 20 a party secretaries like the, the governor who has absolute authority over over a territory and he just implemented all these policies to have like with convenience police stations so a police station every like 500 meters to a kilometer security cameras everywhere um basically like detaining people if they had friends abroad relatives abroad if they've been to muslim countries if they had a history of prayer if they had a history of using foreign websites if they had downloaded vpns and then they took all these people that they had detained, put them in re-education centers, um, and and then uh, you know up to a million people. Some people say a few hundred thousand to two million people were put in these centers, um, where they were forced to kind of study Chinese Communist Party doctrine and laws, um, Mao or Xi Jinping thought, sing patriotic songs, and they spiritually tried to break these people, like just you know, the most intense military discipline. Um, and China says they tried to teach them some technical skills as well, um, like how to, you know, uh, various like occupational skills. But main, the main focus was on reforming them, kind of breaking them psychologically. And then many of these people have been reintroduced back into society and are working in jobs. But some, we don't know how many, but probably hundreds of thousands were just sent to prison. So the question of how did this happen, um, you know, at first, like I was working at Amnesty International, you know, the largest human rights organization at the time. And all of a sudden, within a few months span, we got all of these people, these Uyghurs, writing us letters saying, my cousin has been detained, my mother, I don't know where they are. And we were trying to do so much to, f to figure it out. Eventually, it got to the point where researchers could just look at satellite technology and see all of these major camps that were being built from space. <laughs> and they were, it's hard to kind of deny that mass incarceration is happening when you have facilities that can house 100 or 10,000 people, you know. Um, but they, they more or less have cut off the region from foreign journalists. Um, and so it's been very hard to document. But there's been now so many reports, so much research, so much victim testimony that really the evidence of what's happening is overwhelming, um, which is kind of why there's been momentum to go after China on, on, on human rights. It, it's, it's, so, it's so weird to kind of hear all that because I don't know, like I'm on this, I'm on this similarity between China, Russia kick, you know, like Vladimir Putin's got two legs and Xi Jinping <laughs> has two legs, you know, but, 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 but also like when you're talking about the motivation that, that China used to, you know, kind of propagate this, this assault on the Uyghur population. I, I, as you're talking, all I could think about was like, you know, when, when Russia invaded Chechnya for the first time, you know, under Boris Yeltsin, and then the, the second time when Putin did it and basically went to war with them because they blamed um, them. They blamed the Chechens for blowing up like his apartment um, mm -hmm. building. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's tons of speculation that says that Putin was the one that actually like did it, you yeah. know, to, to kind of like, yeah, like, I've heard that. Yeah. like instill the fear, like use the fear of the people to help support something that will, you know, um, su support their, their mission that they're trying to do, you know? And it's like, it's like every big country seems to do something like that. I mean, and I, I hate to say it, like I live in America, but like, I mean, even with like our Chinese internment camps, you know, <laughs> or, yeah. or, I mean, go, go down the list. Every major country seems like they do this in some form or another. And, and, uh, it's just, it's just so sad. And, um, you know, I don't know it. It's and so with that said, I I'm curious on, um, how you think the U S is responding to what's happening in China. Um, and you know, in our in our secret podcast, Trump was the president. Um, in this podcast, Biden's the president. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, how each sort of um, are responding to it, and, and uh, you know, who who gets the cool points on this one? Yeah. Well, I mean, 
it's a good good question. But let me just say one other thing about the Uyghur situation is that although there were terrorist incidents, um, uh, you know, they've gone way beyond. And, and, and governments have a responsibility to, to protect their their citizens from terrorism. I think that's that's kind of obvious. But China's gone way beyond that. And they've they've detained many cultural figures like poets and you know, like uh, retired doctors and and professors and comedians Mm -hmm. who had no history of terrorism. And I think, quite frankly, I think the idea is to take the leader, Uyghur leaders of the Uyghur culture, which has poetry going back hundreds of years and its own literature tradition and everything, and just more or less cut that off. And just the schools are now only like teaching Chinese and like by, by culturally converting people to only knowing like the Chinese culture, you will then solve the, 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 the issues. Um, so, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like what, what was done to maybe Native Americans and putting them in boarding schools and kind of cutting them off from their culture and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Trump, um, it's interesting because I, I don't think Trump uh, for the first few years, he, he tried to, um, on the one hand, they, they, they recognized that the engagement process was no longer working, I think. Um, but Trump's primary focus was trade. Um, you know, and he had the, the trade deals that he tried to promote. Um, and um, then I think his administration, my, my kind of impression of it is that it was kind of divided. There were hardliners who really, really wanted to go after China. Um, certainly Mike Pompeo, um, I think Mike Pence to a large extent, um, but then there are other people more on the economic side, like maybe Jared Kushner and others who were softer on China. And Trump himself tried to sometimes have it both ways, um, where he would try to say, my great friend Xi, <laughs> but um, at the same time was harsh on China rhetorically. But then I think obviously the breaking point was COVID, where I think Trump personally felt lied to by Xi, who said, this was all going to go away by April or May. And I think, I think uh, Trump believed him um, and then felt betrayed. And then he got in the trade data, which after they had the trade deal, he saw that they weren't really fulfilling the promises. And then he just let loose, you know, and he, <laughs> he, he, he let Mike Pompeo do whatever Mike Pompeo's wanted. And, you know, he was no longer, he was just focused on the election and he was blaming China, you know, the, he was calling it the Kung flu and all that. Yeah. Um, and really, I think, set forth kind of a negative uh, hostility towards Asian Americans in our, our own country, personally. Um, so I think China had hoped that the Biden administration would be kind of a return to normal. What they, you know, maybe like the Obama or George W. Bush years. Um, uh, but I think what they've seen is that you know, Blinken and then Biden said, you know, we, we still agree with the uh, Pompeo's view that what's happening to the Uyghurs is genocide. Um, they've had many sanctions on, on, on Chinese officials um, and have continued to be, at least rhetorically, uh, they've spoken out on Hong Kong and many other issues um, and haven't had. So it hasn't really gone back to the way it was from. Mm-hmm back in the maybe Obama era. Um, And uh, so, yeah, I I think that, um, I mean, I guess it depends on your point of view, but I I, I think things are really kind of in crisis. The relationship is really still, it's it's almost at its worst point ever, um, Mm. with the exception of maybe the the election year um, with Trump. But I think that um, what, from the Chinese point of view, it's, they could perhaps, uh, you know, accept that it was with Trump going a little bit, um, you know, Trump was Trump, right? Mm-hmm. I think that they could accept that degree of, um, that he was a unique individual. Yeah. Um, but I think that they're concerned that um, under someone like Biden, that things are still, um, from their point of view, maybe not, not improved. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you know, China has a whole litany of things that have gone wrong and they don't recognize anything that they've done as contributing to the problem. I mean, from their point of view, things are 100% the Americans fault. Um, So it's difficult to have a relationship improve when 
you know, one party is only blaming the other. So, yeah, you know, it's it's it seems uh, very similar to our our modern politics here in the United States, actually. So, <laughs> well, so, you know, it's it's, in, it's interesting that you mention that because starting from about 2018 or 19, China had a new style on social media where, first of all, all of their diplomats got on Twitter, which before none of them did. Not, I mean, Chinese press releases were the most boring things you could ever read. <laughs> then they all tried to match Trump's style. Like every single person was making insults left and right. And the people who, the guy who first pioneered this, his name is Zhao Lijian, he got promoted. <laughs> so he went from being a no, a no nothing in like Islamabad, like uh, the, the, like some random guy in the in, in the Islamabad consulate or whatever, to then being promoted to the foreign ministry uh, spokesperson. <laughs> so everyone within the system is like ah. So they're all like aping the Trump style. Um, it's called Wolf Warrior diplomacy because they had a Rambo style movie uh-huh. called Wolf Warrior. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, so they're they're all like these Rambos on Twitter. Um, and you know, it's basically owning the libs. What I like to think of it is like, you know, the, the Ben Shapiro, like own the libs, yeah, know? yeah, yeah. where it's not about like, you know, a David French style or mm-hmm. Jonah Goldberg, let's promote a conservative worldview with rationality that, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, shows how the liberal worldview is, is not, um, better for human flourishing. It's like, no, nah, let's own the libs and show them like, you know, kind of in a very flashy style. And that's what they've taken to doing. So I think it's really, but instead of owning the libs, it's own the West or own the U.S. (laughs) That's so funny. But what I think to make the analogy with our domestic politics is part of that style is about creating negative partisanship where Mm -hmm. you may think, oh, as a Republican, well, a lot of these Republicans are worthless, but at least they're not like the Democrats, you know, (laughs) because you hate them worse, you know, Mm -hmm. or, or vice versa, right? Um, so I think it's a lot about basically saying how hypocritical the U.S. is, how how they're just causing problems everywhere they go and kind of constantly hammering home that message mm. is a way that, you know, for Chinese like elites and people who read English fluently is a way to kind of get them on board and keep them on board. And so so are, are you telling me that that we should uh, keep TikTok on our phones or should we delete it? Well, I'd, I'd delete it personally. Yeah, <laughs> my 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 wife has TikTok. I don't have TikTok on my phone. Uh, I, I somehow have TikTok on my phone, but I think I'm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think the company BitDance has said they don't transfer data to China. Sure. Um, yeah. Wink, wink. No, nod. nod. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Leave that for what you will. I mean, I, I I I'm very suspicious of big tech in general. So. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. They're all the, they're all evil. Uh, but hey, but hey, uh, Will, uh, William, thank you very much for, uh, yeah, thank for you. coming back on the show. I, uh, so I really, beautiful. really appreciate it. And with, with any luck, this won't be our, our second secret podcast. So <laughs> yeah, I hope yeah. fingers this, uh, crossed. <laughs> yeah. It I hope it stays, uh, stays there and is not, um, doesn't become, uh, it's not on the secret podcast list. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I hope not either. But uh, but but thanks again. And uh, yeah, we will see everybody uh, next week. And yeah, take care, guys. Bye. Bye. All right. See you, Josh.